Good evening, everyone. I'm Stephen Toop, and uh, as Vice Chancellor of the University of Cambridge, it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you to the second Dr. Yusuf Hamid Frontiers in Chemistry event. I'm delighted that we can meet virtually as we continue our well-established online event program. Sharing our work from Cambridge and its impact with you, our alumni and supporters, is one of the most important things we do, and I'm very glad that you can join us this evening. It's a pleasure to see both new and familiar faces, and I'd like to extend a special welcome, of course, to Yusuf and Frida Hamid. We're privileged to count our Yusuf Hamid Department of Chemistry as one of the very best in the world. Cambridge scientists have been making life-changing discoveries for centuries, and the Frontiers in Chemistry series ensures the wider world can marvel at and celebrate these advances with us in real time. As we seek understanding and inspiration in the wake of COP26, this webinar series is particularly relevant and vital to our future. During the inaugural webinar in May, for example, we explored the contributions chemistry can make in the move to a carbon neutral world. This evening, Professor Erwin Reisner will present a future scenario where waste, water, and air are precious resources in a solar-powered, carbon-neutral economy and society. We owe this unique opportunity to the generosity and vision of Dr. Yusuf Hamid, an alumnus of Christ College. His extraordinary gift is transforming the study of chemistry at Cambridge and has also enabled us to gather virtually this evening for another fascinating talk. We're fortunate to have this singular glimpse into the inner workings and discoveries of a remarkable department, and we're grateful to Dr. Hamid for making this possible. So thank you. And now it's my pleasure to turn uh, the podium, so to speak, over to Professor Jeremy Saunders to introduce Professor Erwin Reisner. Well, thank you very much, Stephen. I would like to add my welcome to, uh, to all of you, some faces who we've seen at the previous webinars, but I'm also delighted uh, that we have some new, uh, some new guests as well. Do feel free to turn your cameras on, but keep your microphone muted until we get to the Q&A session. Uh, and if you're asking a question, then of course you can uh, un unmute. Uh, this part of uh, Owen's talk is going to be recorded, but the Q&A session will not be. Uh, so Irwin's laboratory explores the area which embraces chemical biology, synthetic chemistry, material science and engineering, all relevant to the development of solar driven processes for the sustainable synthesis of fuels and chemicals. He's been coordinating the UK Solar Fuels Network, which organises uh, the national activities in artificial photosynthesis, and he's also the academic lead here in Cambridge of the, uh, the Cambridge Centre, uh, or Cambridge Creative Circular Plastics Centre. Uh, so that's all I'm going to say. I'm going to invite Erwin now to give us his, his presentation on capturing sunlight to power a circular economy. Erwin. It thanks a lot to Jeremy and also the Vice, uh, Vice Chancellor for the opening remarks and introduction, and of course to Yusuf Hamid for the for the support. It's a real pleasure to give the Hamid Francis in Chemistry webinar and share our latest work um, with you. While I bring up my slides, I'd also like to uh, really thank the Cambridge admin and support team for all the guidance in setting up and organizing this event. So the title of the talk is uh, Capturing Sunlight to Power a Circular Economy. And what I would like to share with you is really what my lab does uh, or has developed over the last 10 years. And our focus is really the development um, of novel concepts and early stage technologies for the sustainable synthesis of fuels and chemicals powered by sunlight. So I will first give a, a brief introduction of the challenge and the motivation. I will see um, how we look at the current problem of sustainability and then towards the second part of the talk, really give you three concrete examples of technologies we have developed over the years. So as a starting point, the challenge, and we are facing a historical challenge, and this 416.6 really represents this challenge extremely well. And as the Vice Chancellor already um, alluded to, we had the COP26 um, in the last couple of weeks. Um, here are two speakers of this event, David Attenborough, 
um, and greater Thunberg. And I will keep this really short because they articulate this challenge much better than I do. And, and you will all be familiar that this number of 416.6 refers to the atmospheric level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And you can see here the evol evolution of CO2 in the atmosphere and the recent increase um, in, more reasonable, uh, in more recent times since the Industrial Revolution. And this really goes up very quickly. And of course, this correlates with increasing temperatures um, and it's associated also with, with climate change. So when I, I look at this, this graph, this hockey stick, um, the only comparison I would like to make an analogy is, is really another event that was in the, in, the, in the public in the last two years. And it's quite well reflected by this plot here. And you can also see this hockey stick behavior. And what this plot here shows you are really the COVID numbers in the UK between January and February 2020. Um, and I like this analogy because what we see at the moment with CO2 levels going up is we don't know exactly how high it will go and we don't know what it means. And in February 2020, we also did not know what all of this meant. But the one thing that was certain is the earlier we react, the more uh, precautions we take, the safer we are and the less severe consequences we may face in the future. So I think that's a, um, a way to think and to look at it. And of course, I would also argue um, the challenge of, of climate change is significantly more severe because everything is much more long term and any actions we take today still take years or decades actually to see the effect in the real world. But I would not like to, to talk about problems, challenges um, or negative aspects. I would really like only to look at opportunities today. How can we actually take this challenge and maybe transform the world and look at different technologies and scenarios? And the first one is really the energy transition. Um, here we can see the current primary energy supply by source over the years until 2021, and it's primarily oil, gas, and coal, about 80%. We have a small amount of nuclear, bioenergy, and a quite a small proportion still of solar, wind, and other renewable sources. And despite this being small, I think we all can already see when we go to Scotland or even the Norfolk coast, the large amount of wind farms that are being created. When we travel through continental Europe, the large amount of photovoltaic parks being created. But we still face massive transformations. And that's the scenario from the International Energy Agency, how this could change by 2050. So we see a reduction of fossil fuels to about 10% and the real dominance by wind and solar. So that's encouraging. And of course, we would like to see this, the, this rebuilding of the global infrastructure and the transitioning to a renewable infrastructure. However, there's another important point to make here. What you can see today, the vast majority of our energy carriers are fuels. So it's actually relatively easy to store these fuels, transport and use them when needed. But despite this dominance of fossils, already today we face energy shortages due to energy storage issues. So I think you can imagine how this will even become much more precarious as we go into the future, as wind solar start dominating and we almost exclusively transition to electricity generation. So there is this huge lack of fossils or storable forms of energy where we do not really have a solution at the moment. And that's really where um, our work, I believe, becomes relevant. And here's exactly where chemistry plays this key role. So to enable this energy storage, we need chemistry. We need catalysis to make hydrogen or other energy carriers. Um, this allows us to store energy. This allows us to produce renewable fuels for use for transportation. But ultimately, we need to think even further. Ultimately, at some point, the chemical or the petrochemical industry sector need to transition and also become renewable. And what I mean by this is really that chemistry itself is destined to fundamentally change in a transition to a post-fossil era. And I would just like to illustrate this. So today, this is a little scenario of our chemistry department on Lensfield Road that most of you will still be familiar with. We see the chemistry department here, Scott Polar, and, and other buildings that can be recognized. And many of these uh, items I've shown here, all of them are really made from fossil fuels. I don't need to go into details, but we can see plastics, of course, from fossil steel. We need coal or hydrogen to make them textiles, plastic derived electronics, tires, tarmac, fertilizer, toiletries, medical supplies really made from fossil fuels. So that's at the moment we take as a given, but we are not really looking at making these renewable in the current energy scenarios. What we really only consider is putting up renewable energy sources such as wind or solar panels. And then we hope we can buffer some of this energy with batteries. 
However, the, the, the challenge for batteries is massive. At the moment, at the scale, batteries will not be the only solution. They will be a big part of the solution, but we really need um, storage options for the transition. So how does the petrochemical industry work at the moment? How do we make all of these items that I've just shown before? So they are derived from fossil fuels. And this is what I would call the organic chemistry of the fossil age. From fossil fuels, we generate a large amount of basic chemicals. Here, aromatics, ammonia, syngas, acetylene, methanol. These are really the basic feedstocks. And from those and a couple of processing steps in the refineries and chemical industry, we can make the products that are shown here. Chemicals, kerosene, rubber, fertilizer, foams, fibers, plastics. And they ultimately find some use. But as you can see, as we start transitioning and move away from fossil fuels, this entire chain is under threat. We will not be able to maintain this production scenario in the very long term. At some point, we will need to transition. And that's what I would like to show here on the right-hand side. So in the post-fossil age, I believe the organic chemistry will look fundamentally different. We will not source all our, our carbon and energy from fossils. We will look at renewable resources. We still want to have the same uses. We still have uses in pharma, fuels, vehicles, food, construction, clothing, healthcare. But the big question is how do we get and use our renewable energy sources to make these products? And this is where sustainable chemistry comes in that is being developed in my laboratory and elsewhere in the world. And the big question, how does it look like? And we do not have a precise answer today. I only know it will be different. So there will be a, a large range of sustainable feedstocks that can be in part the same as the ones derived from the petrochemical industry, but there will be a large number of feedstocks that will be entirely different. And I believe it will also be a chemistry with much more heteroatoms. It will be oxygen rich if we think about biomass and other substrates that we are converting. And this has huge implications, not just the feedstocks will change, anything will change, the solvents in the lab will change, and how we uh, run reactions will change as well. And then ultimately, of course, the goal is to make some products that are quite similar, of course, with properties and scale so that we can maintain the supply chain for the end users here. So I think that's a hugely exciting space for chemistry. And I believe this will be a dominant type of chemistry in the next 20 to 30 years to come. So we're excited to be part of this at this stage. The question is, which energy source is for us the most exciting? Um, and this graph is a bit overwhelming, but I will uh, talk you through, and it shows essentially the price of renewable electricity. And it shows the price uh, on 20, uh, 2009 and 2019, and this is plotted at the y-axis as levelized cost of energy. And what this LOCE stands for, it's essentially the price of electricity from a new power plant. If you were to build it today, then you operate it until the end of the lifetime, and the cost here is essentially the cost of, ele of the electricity, how you would need to sell it to cover your costs. So I think it's quite a fair representation of real costs today of these energy forms. And you can see the most dramatic change. So I've moved to Cambridge in 2009. And when I talked to my colleagues in the physics department, the optoelectronics, they complained rightly that photovoltaics were simply still too expensive. Every year I, go I went to my physics colleagues they became more and more excited. Every year they told me prices are going down, they're collapsing. And at some point, 14, 15, the real excitement came in. We knew from an academic point of view that PV will become the cheapest energy form very soon. And you can see this very linear trend. I mean, here it's a linear trend with two points, but it would also be linear if we put all the individual points here. And what you can see is that this levelized cost of energy went down from 359 megawatt hours to $40 in this case, and this is 2009, so it is still going down. How do other renewables compare? So you can see onshore wind also becomes very attractive now, down from 135 to 41. Other renewable solar thermal towers, um, you may have noticed from the news, uh, there's, there are less discussions today, and simply because the, case, uh, the numbers have not come down as dramatic as for photovoltaics. So PV seems to be superior than really solar thermal chemistry in this case. And what about the less renewable uh, forms? In this case, gas is still a quite a cheap form to make electricity at $56, but you can already see it's higher than photovoltaics in most parts of the world. And combined cycle here means a gas power plant in continuous operation, and that's in contrast to a peaker plant, which is only switch, uh, switched on at peak demand. So this is why the price here is much higher. Um, the last one I would like to point out is nuclear energy. Nuclear energy is in fact the one where prices are going up so one may question this huge investment between some parts 
or some parts of the world in nuclear energy. It's actually not cost competitive. And the big question is, is it worth the risk to build more power plants? But it's beyond my talk here today. So what does it mean? Solar energy today is abundant and it's extremely cheap. So the, the arguments from the past that PV is an ideal source but too expensive are simply not true anymore. It is really here and it will stay. The prices of solar energy have declined by almost 90% in 10 years time, which I feel is, is a remarkable. And why did these prices come down so dramatically? It's simply the economy of scale for photovoltaics, in particular mass uh, production in many countries such as China. And what we can see here is the doubling of capacity drops the price by 20%. This is also known as the learning rate. So if we produce twice the amount, prices go down 20%. So if, if we keep building, if we keep producing, and if we really drive this energy transition, PV will keep uh, becoming cheaper. But to drive this, this also means we need to develop new markets for photovoltaics. So at some point we will leave and uh, uh, hit the natural limit for electricity. And this is also where many other applications can come in. Heating is just one of them, but I feel chemistry should really be a core market to drive future development for solar energy. Again, using the photovoltaic energy or solar derived energy to drive chemistry in particular for sustainable economies and circular economy um, systems. So that's really the background for the research in my laboratory. So we try to develop a solar chemistry for a circular economy. So this could also be called as photocatalysis, but in this case, it's photocatalysis simply focused on sunlight and circular systems. We look at sustainable resources as input. The primarily is water as a solvent. And water, usually, of course, we use distilled water um, to do good science or to do reproducible science, but we work more and more in the laboratory with actually much more relevant sources such as seawater and polluted sources. Ultimately, we'd like to see this development in particular for developing countries to be employed, where it's arguably the most attractive because we're not comp competing face on with the established incumbent or the oil companies. Carbon dioxide and nitrogen, we look at air. Can we simply source this greenhouse gas that I introduced in the beginning and actually use it as a carbon feedstock? Can we use nitrogen as a feedstock to make interesting nitrogen containing molecules? And waste, we look at biomass and plastic waste. So anything that's being thrown out in the big issue um, for waste mitigation, we look at waste an extremely valuable resource. If we look at biomass or plastics, it's full of energy and it's full of chemistry. And actually we wanna use it, we don't wanna throw it away. So actually combining the ideas of waste mitigation and producing valuable chemicals. And ultimately we really wanna enter the organic field. Can we drive all these chemical processes with sunlight or renewably and drive not just the development of feedstock, but actually further down towards the end uses of products. So this is solar powered chemistry. That's just where the energy comes from to drive this chemistry rather than high temperature, for example. And with these simple feedstocks, we can produce all of uh, resources. We can produce all of these feedstock. Hydrogen, ammonia has been done, carbon monoxide and formic acid. And I will introduce in my talk today, hydrogen, carbon monoxide and formic acid and show how we can quite easily source it from this, the sustainable resources. These feedstocks do not look very exciting, but actually they are because they're very high in energy. So it's very simple to drive successive chemistry from there or sequential chemistry. And this can be done often even by established chemical processes. So there is a possibility to transition a large part of a petrochemical plant to a sustainable chemistry plant, an idea we're interested in. So can we use this feedstock and start building up synthetic fuels such as green gasoline, kerosene? Can we support agriculture fertilizer production, for example, especially when we think of ammonia. And again, the entire chemical space, plastics, pharma materials, in principle, we could source sustainably through this process. Then of course, with the product in place, we wanna use them, we wanna recycle them, but even in a worst case scenario where we just discard them or burn them off, all we are doing is we just regain our resources. So we re recreate carbon dioxide, waste and water. So this is really the idea of the circular economy that we are interested in here. And here again comes in the Lensfield Road. How can we help and support this? When we think of the chemistry department, we can simply remove the car park um, during the, the day. Of course, we have sunlight. At the moment, I'm, I'm, I'm not in my office. I'm in college because it's at night, but tomorrow morning when the sun comes out, I will be back. And then we can really look at solar chemistry in this space. So we, have, we will need fairly large areas to collect light. And then we use water, waste and air to drive the chemistry. 
And this chemistry in principle can then be used in the industry to make exactly synthetic fuels, chemicals, pharma, plastics, fertilizers, steel. And I'm happy to elaborate on, on these later more if there's interest. But of course, this can be more. This is really just to enter the chemical space. But what about transport and the most urgent problems? So the nice aspect here by using this chemistry or solar lights to do chemistry, we can now store it. So this depends on what we make. We can store the energy as hydrogen. We can store the energy as, as, as carbon monoxide forming acid, as alcohols, you name it. Ultimately, it's the development of the catalyst that's essential. And we will be able to make a large range of chemical storage products here. Then we can support transport, which is shown here. As I mentioned, green gasoline as one example. Of course, even more urgent would be aviation. But in this case, I've not really talked yet with Downing College and got approval for an, an airport site on the college grounds. But in principle, this, of course, is also interesting in the context of kerosene. And although this looks very inefficient, it can also be useful for electricity generation, which means whenever we have grid problems to convert the fuel back to electricity. And I'm saying it sounds like a strange scenario because it's extremely inefficient if you collect sunlight make a fuel and convert it back with a fuel cell to make electricity. It is really inefficient. But as we produce more and more electricity and the prices go down, and often you're even paid to collect electricity, this can really make economic sense. And it, it may make sense already, and I'm convinced it will do in 10, 20 years. So from a technology ready, uh, level, what are the approaches that are currently being pursued widely in the community? The simplest technology to make this happen is simply to use what we already have. And this would be a photovoltaic panel, like silicon that you know from the roofs. And you can just wire this up to a water electrolyzer. So a water electrolyzer is a device where you apply a voltage and it separates water to make hydrogen and oxygen. So this is something we see already at pre-commercial level. And I'm uh, familiar with several, several companies, even at household level, construct PV panels on the roof, water electrolysis in the basement, and hydrogen storage in the garden below the soil usually. So these systems work. They're not cheap enough yet, um, but again, as systems are rolled out at larger scale, they may well become in the future. So this is what we would consider quite mature. We can do this already. From a scientific point of view, more interested uh, for me are really these two approaches here. On the center, the first one, these are photoelectrochemical cells. Effectively, simply put, it's the same as this PV electrolysis, but everything integrated in a single device. And this has several advantages. First of all, it has much less material use, which is interesting from a sustainability point of view. And also we can deal with uh, heat management much better. So these photovoltaic panels often heat up quite significantly under solar irradiation, which actually harms the efficiency. But heat often benefits catalysis. So we believe with, with thermal management and general more light management, we can really boost the efficiencies of these cells, hopefully beyond commercially pre-ready systems. And last but not least are these very simple systems, almost like solution or powder systems. So all you do here is you have a little reactor, you add as a solution your, your, your catalysts or some semiconducting powders, you shine light and your chemistry occurs. So there are no cables, and this is by far the most, um, or the cheapest design, unfortunately at the moment the least efficient. So there's a bit of a trade-off, what you would really like to see, something extremely simple, um, versus something that's much more expensive, but is more efficient. But we really hope to develop these two technologies here, or we are doing this at the moment. So the first uh, system from our lab I would like to introduce um, are really integrated devices and can be considered thin film um, technologies. So it's nothing else than a little panel. You can almost think like a photovoltaic panel that we emerge in an aqueous solution, um, water, which means we separate it then um, with carbon dioxide waste organics or the substrate of our choice and then we shine light and then these panels essentially drive the chemistry so rather than producing electricity you run the chemistry in this aqueous solution and as i mentioned before this can really be polluted with aqueous solution or sea salt as uh, um, seawater for example how do we do this um, so we can really base this technology on a lot of semiconductor development over the years this is just one of the panels developed in the laboratory this is five times five centimeters, as you can see the, the fingers here. And what we do is we develop the chemistry to modify these surfaces with these catalysts. So we just take the best from the photovoltaics field, if you like, and all we do is surface engineering and including catalysis here. So you can think of this like a, a catalyst that we develop in the lab. We have a link and an anchor, and all of this integrates it nicely into these panels. 
And then what we do um, at the local level is we really try to tune the microenvironment to make the catalysis as efficient as possible. So we make sure the substrates really can approach the catalytic site as efficient as possible. The products can be removed efficiently. And then to make sure we are energy efficient, we need to stabilize these intermediates. Just two examples here. One is hydrogen bonding, and here's Coulomb stabilization. And Coulomb st stabilization is nothing else than electrostatic control um, of the intermediates. And by tuning all these intermediate st uh, steps, really we lose very little energy, which means we can use a lot of the solar energy and convert it into our product. That really is the idea here. That's what we develop here in Cambridge. This here is the first uh, system I'd like to show. This is from uh, Virgil Andre. He was a PhD student in the group and he's now a junior research fellow here at St. John's College. And you can see him looking very proudly at his photoelectrochemical cell. And this PEC device here, you can see a zoom in, has nothing else than one of these panels. And in the very center is where we shine the light into the chemistry. So here's a simple cartoon representation. Again, we use components from the photovoltaic field. One of the light absorbers would be a perovskite element. They're very popular now. Um, for high efficiency uh, electricity production. A second one up is business venadate, another light absorbent semiconductor. And then the key here is we need to integrate our catalyst. So on one side here, we have a catalyst that makes syngas. I come back to this in a second. And on the other side, we have an oxygen evolution catalyst. So when we shine light, water is here chemically being oxidized to produce oxygen. We are not really interested so much in this oxygen. We are more interested in these electrons we can extract from the water because we need these electrons on the other side to convert this carbon dioxide and water into syngas. And syngas is carbon monoxide and hydrogen. And again, I'll come back to the use of syngas in a second. But first, I just like to illustrate how this looks like. So here I have a glass cell so that you can see this much better. And simulated solar light comes from the left and hits these little panels. And what you can see when it hits the panels is this generation of bubbles. So on this side here, carbon dioxide saturated in the aqueous solution is converted into these bubbles that are carbon monoxide and hydrogen. And on the other side, the oxygen is coming out. So this system really works. It is like a solar panel in solution converting carbon dioxide to make this very interesting energy rich thin gas mixture. Just to be not being told off that I'm oversimplifying the problem, this little cartoon system or representation was really many years of work. And in fact, it requires many layers. So I do not wish to discuss all of these layers in detail, but I ensure you all of these layers have a very defined role and serve a very specific purpose. So this, the purpose is to make sure everything is properly tight, stabilized, encapsulated. And also we can extract charge efficiently and we can make sure we don't lose energy along the way. So it takes a lot of engineering to develop these layers and really tune them in a, in a functional system. And of course, ultimately, we also need catalysts. And this is one of these cobalt porphyrin catalysts that allow us to make syngas in this, this case. Syngas, why are we interested in syngas? This was really an idea that led to a, a like fairly large center that was supported over seven years here. And the center idea was, again, convert CO2 and water into syngas. And syngas is a major chemical feedstock in the petrochemical industry. But today we make it from fossil fuels. So it's extremely polluting. And we make it on a hundreds of megaton scale. So if we would find um, a route to make the syngas sustainably, we could source a lot of the current petrochemicals very sustainably. And some examples are liquid fuels such as hydrocarbons, chemicals, plastics, fertilizers, steel. So there are a lot of possibilities. And so we remain very interested in the syngas chemistry but important to emphasize sustainable syngas chemistry and not petro derived syngas. So then the, the second system I would like to show is um, from Chien Wang. Chien Wang was a postdoc in my group and she is now an associate professor at the University of Nagoya in Japan. And what she developed is the deposition of semiconducting powders um, on conducting substrates. So rather than introducing these layered structures um, for photovoltaics as we had before, it's simply little particles from a, a nano to micron size that we deposit in a controlled manner. And then we co-integrate here our catalysts. So in this case, the semiconductors pick up um, the light. And again, the charges flow to a catalyst here that oxidizes water to oxygen. And the electrons make all the way here to another catalyst. And in this case, um, to convert carbon dioxide to formic acid. So the output here is very similar as before. 
But instead of making carbon monoxide or thin gas, we simply make formic acid. And formic acid can be used for many other purposes. So one use for formic acid is even a use as a, in, a form, uh, in a fuel cell, and there's much development ongoing in this context. So this is what I wanted to show um, in the space of solar carbon capture and utilization. Um, where are we today? What I tried to show you is just two very simple systems, early stage development, where we can show a completely standalone system that convert carbon dioxide into energy carriers and fuels. This means we do not apply any electricity externally. We do not feed chemicals to drive the process. These are little panels. You can just put them in water and to do the, the work. What's the limitations at the moment? What would we like to develop in the future? One is the catalysis per se. There's a lot of ground we can still cover. First of all, we would not like to use concentrated CO2 streams. We would like down to very dilute CO2 streams. The end goal would be atmospheric CO2. And it would be great if we could go straight away to liquid transport fuels. Then efficiency. Um, at the moment, often we are still stuck below a percent. Ultimately, we need to go beyond 10% to be really commercially ready. And stability, going from day stability at the moment of the devices to years. Then what I would like to show is also what we need to do is reactor design. And that's a, a challenge for a chemist because we were not really used to this. So we are teaming up now with chemical engineers or have chemical engineering postdocs in the lab. And I would just like to show you some iterations. So you will not see much uh, standard uh, 20th century uh, glassware anymore in our lab. Very often we 3D print or really engineer ourselves. The first cell here is indeed a 3D printed cell, polylactic acid. And you can see it has a very rough design. In fact, it's even quite leaky because you can see we fix it and seal it with Plutech. But the real nice advantage of the 3D printing is that we can do the experiments during the day. In the evening, we can redesign it. We print it overnight and the next morning we have a fresh cell available. So I think that's extremely powerful to optimize reactors and to go through many iterations. Once we have the final reactor, we can properly engineer this. This year was a cell we built together with the University of Porto. And you can see it's much better built and designed, everything properly in place, it's, it's tight. But the drawback here is workshop time is about two to three months. So this is not suitable for fast iteration. And the current challenge for us is really scaling. So how do we go now from a few square centimeters to square meters and beyond? And for the preparative chemists in the audience, you may recognize this tank. That's in fact the preparative TLC uh, tank that we have repurposed for one of our solar reactors. And then here we have about a 400 square centimeter panel for to do solar chemistry. And uh, one square meter is in production at the moment. The last system of the day I would like to show is solar reforming. Um, and this is work done by Moritz Kühnel. He's now a, a senior lecturer at Swansea University. David Wakerley um, was a PhD student, then postdoc at Collège de France in Paris and Stanford. And he recently set up his startup company on CO2 conversion and just won the Bill Gates Breakthrough Energy Prize. And Taylor Uckert was a PhD student and also left recently. And she's now a scientist at NREL, which is the National Renewable Energy Lab in Colorado. And what they developed essentially is a system where we can convert waste, biomass and plastic with water. Then with one of our catalysts uh, we developed, these are now little powder systems very often. And these powder systems can collect the light and use this energy to break down the waste and extract hydrogen. It's a sustainable clean fuel and co-produce chemicals from this waste. So it's, it's a very attractive, simple process where we actually serve three purposes, mitigation of waste, production of fuel, and production of sustainable chemicals. On the topic of biomass, I would just like to emphasize that we only work at the moment on lignocellulosic biomass. This means the emphasis is on biomass that is not in competition with agriculture, that is not in competition with food production. So we only use actually the waste products from the food industry. And plastic, of course, is a, is a, is a fossil derived material. And yes, this to some extent for, for those who have been in around in, in, in the 80s of Mr. Fusion, um, I hope that this system will be less uh, more successful than cold fusion, but the idea indeed would be, can we just convert waste very simply into energy carriers? So here's a simple illustration how this looks like. Um, we have a test tube, we have a little piece of wood, we have a yellow solution that contains this little photocatalyst we develop in the lab that gives the yellow color. And if we now shine simulated solar light, you will see that after a bit of time, 
we see this generation actually quite vigorous evolution of, of hydrogen bubbles. So this already shows the concept works. Even with this crude, untreated wood, we can just put it in solution, shine something that resembles solar light and generate hydrogen. And the nice aspect here I mentioned before is clean hydrogen. So we believe that this hydrogen is clean enough for applications in, in fuel cells. Here you can see how this works. What we have here at the y-axis is the amount of hydrogen and a couple of substrates. And you can, this is really real world waste that we can use from printer paper, cardboard, newspaper, wooden branch, which is shown here, bagasse, which is from the sugarcane waste industry, grass and sawdust, anything gives to some degree hydrogen. So what about plastics? So the plastic industry today is a very much linear economy. These numbers here are million metric tons, and we can see by, by 2017, a few years ago now, the primary production of plastics was about 8.3 billion tons, almost everything produced from fossil fuels. In use is still about two and a half billion tons. We have recycled only a very small amount, 0.6 billion tons. From this recycled plastics, 0.1 billion tons still in secondary use, but the vast majority really has been just discarded in landfills and a little bit incinerated which at least gives some of the energy back, ideally. But you can see the scenario is surely not satisfying. And what I mentioned before is true. We really look at plastics. It should not go to waste. It causes all sorts of issues, but it's such an energy rich um, product that we want to use. And I can show here um, in this test tube is exactly the same as we had before with this wooden stem, just extend the concepts to plastics. So what you see here is a little piece of uh, a PET water bottle very much as I shamef shamefully also have in my, my office here. So we cut this down, we covered this with our photocatalyst, we put it in the aqueous solution, it's, it's actually alkaline, and then we shine light, and you can see how this photocatalyst at the surface of the plastics really starts eating in and starts degrading the plastics. And the bubbles you see again are hydrogen that's being generated in the process. This here shows now a little bit of the scaling um, we are running. So this means we go from this little test tubes now to a hundred, couple of hundred milliliter reactors and beyond. And we really hope also to push this towards um, application in the near future. Our works on, on plastics has led to this Cambridge Creative Circular Plastic Center. I know that I'm running out of time already. I just wanna briefly mention that it's a great collective effort within the university spanning eight departments where we really look at all aspects of place plastic waste. We, we see how it's being produced, um, how it's manufactured, where pollution comes from, where it ends up, how we can actually solve problems of circularity. And we look at this again from many different views and has been a very engaging activity. The, the work on, on plastics and biomass in particular also brought me a lot to think about United Nations sustainability goals. And I think when, when I arrived in Cambridge, one realization was is that my goal is really number seven, um, focus on, on affordable and clean energy. But of course, over the years, the, the view has broadened quite significantly. So first of all, we cannot look at this in isolation at all. Clean energy is directly linked to climate action. And in this case, I'm very lucky to have many great colleagues in the department um, looking at atmospheric chemistry. Um, and, and they look a lot, of course, how the climate is changing. And I think that that's really something we need to do together in this regard. But ultimately, all of these, in a way or another, are interlinked. If we can sort out affordable clean energy, democratize energy, decentralize energy, we can really address many, many of these, of these problems. To wrap up here, what I wanted to show you is really just what we do in the department. Um, I hope you found it interesting, but maybe as a summary, just to show you also how the technologies are really evolving. So this here was the very first device we built in the laboratory, finalized in 2012 here by Chia Yu Lin. And it was the first autonomous device. So in this system, we could shine light and it could do chemistry with other external inputs. But the system was extremely inefficient. In fact, looking at this today, I see we engineered this very poorly. And all it could do is produce tiny amounts of hydrogen very inefficiently. Today, we look at much better engineered systems. You can see the scale, how this from a very clunky, large, inefficient device actually goes down to something that's, that's very small. You can see here a tweezer. And if we turn this 90 degrees, you can actually see this type of panel devices in this case. And it really resembles much, much more than a leaf today. So people would call this artificial leaves as well. And indeed, it mimics this in the form of shape and function. And in this nine years, the efficiencies have gone up dramatically. And what excites me most is the space of chemistry is evolving at a very fast pace. 
just us going to making some hydrogen, we can convert carbon dioxide, we can upcycle waste and produce more and more different compounds and, and broaden the chemistry scope here. So my time is up. Um, I would like to thank all of the, my co-workers. The time only allowed me to show three different examples, but I really have an amazing group. I'm, I'm super lucky. And of course, also the, the funding bodies. Thanks a lot for your attention. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Mm -hmm.